Welcome to Preceptor Module 5 on Evaluation, brought to you by the Montana Center to Advance Health Through Nursing, Montana Con, the Academic Progression in Nursing, the APEN grant funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. As mentioned in the four previous webinars, the Montana Con is the official state action coalition of the Future of Nursing Campaign for Action in Montana. And my name is Sandra Kuntz, and I'm a faculty member at Montana State University College of Nursing and the co-project director of the APEN grant. I'm pleased to welcome you to this fifth and final webinar for the preceptor, for preceptors in this particular series. As you know, the purpose of the five modules in this series is to enhance preceptor effectiveness and satisfaction with the precepting experience. And the criteria for successful completion of this module is just a little different. Uh, you need to attend the entire webinar and complete and submit the evaluation at the end of the webinar. Although there is no associated reading or a blog for this particular module, we will post pertinent additional resources related to this module that are discussed during the, uh, this webinar on the Montana Con website. We hope these additional resources will be useful to you in your preceptor practice. And again, contact hours, one contact hour is allowed for this webinar uh, through the Montana Nurses uh, Association. This module focuses on that, this final piece of the puzzle of the circle on evaluation and links, links with all four previous modules, roles and relationships in module one, and communication module two, learning styles and teaching strategies in module three, and planning the precepting experience that we talked about in Module 4. The objective for Module 5 is to examine strategies for evaluation of precepting. Weihart and Figueroa in 2014, page 153, state that evaluating performance and providing feedback are two of the most critical activities preceptors facilitate during preceptorships. Ausbach in 2000, page 101, adds that the evaluator role is often the least familiar and the most anxiety provoking of the preceptor's roles. However, my personal objective is for this, for this module is that you not only examine some evaluation strategies, but also feel confident in applying the strategies to this portion of your role. If you recall the Elsevier-Mosby model of preceptor roles we referred to in Module 1, the role of evaluator is nested under the educator role. As I think about this, it makes a lot of sense. Many of us have developed in the profession as a result of excellent teaching, coaching, and evaluation, including self-evaluation. Evaluation is a powerful teaching tool. And just to re remember what we've talked about through all of this, the educator role, the protector, safeguard the patient, and the preceptee role, and the facilitator role, model, socializer, and team leader. And so the preceptor is an important part of the life of the new grad, the undergrad, or anyone, um, a new orientee uh, to a unit. So anyone who is new to, uh, to a role that they're going to be taking on in the future. <clears throat> Our inquiry questions, uh, they're, we hope they're simple, straightforward, and practical. The first is, what is a preceptor's role in evaluation? What tools are available for evaluation? How are goals, objectives, competencies measured through the use of the evaluation tools? What approach do you use to provide effective, positive, and constructive feedback? What is the role of self-reflection? and self-assessment in evaluation. What performance evaluation rubrics are available to you? And how does a preceptor provide formative and summative assessments? If you remember our slide of the mountain goats uh, and the, the role of evaluator, evaluators provide feedback to preceptees on the quality of their performance related to the expected outcomes of the experience. And that's from Allspock, also 2000, page 100. So 
the quality of their performance related to the expected outcomes of the experience. And in Module 4, we previously talked about how you develop and how you plan that experience so that you have those um, outcomes identified in advance. <clears throat> Your work in this role as evaluator is simplified and made more manageable when a clearly written plan is in place that specifies the accountabilities, objectives, and destination points that must be accomplished along the way from A to Z, from ledge to ledge, or from the start date to the end date of orientation. Along the way, the preceptor in the evaluator role helps the preceptee find the path to success and celebrates when the goal is reached. There are uh, quite a few terms and tools of evaluation we could apply. For this module, we will focus on just four tools, evaluation tools, feedback, self-assessment, performance evaluation, and formative and summative assessments. So for the first, for feedback, in um, terms of evaluate, this evaluation tool of uh, giving feedback, Swihart and Figueroa, uh, 2014 pages 154 through 155, describe useful feedback as specific, factual, descriptive, clearly understood by both parties, strategically timed, constructive, and when possible, positive. Positive feedback uh, produces feelings of success, is a motivator, and reinforces performance. Negative feedback discourages and demoralizes, reduces motivation, and the focus is on what not to do. And so that's why uh, looking at the positive rather than negative feedback is so important. Uh, I think we would understand the whole idea behind being helpful and useful in teaching using constructive feedback versus destructive, doing anything to demoralize or um, just uh, provide disincentives um, going forward for an individual. So what we try to do in education and in practice is be as constructive and positive as we can. Also, the whole idea of continuous and ongoing versus episodic or unpredictable feedback is really important. So that when we have an action, then a reaction, then we can modify and back to a re doing the action again, we have made an improvement. So this idea of being available to provide feedback on a continuous basis, whether it's at the end of the day, at the end of 15 minutes of an important event, um, at the end of the week, but in a predictable fashion. I think that is very useful. And we've heard positive things from preceptees that come back from um, experiences where people work with them positively, constructively, and in a continuous fashion. The second tool uh, is self-reflection, self-assessment. And along with that process goes journals and logs. And in education, we use journals and logs uh, quite a bit. Of course, nurses have so much to chart and um, really to think about all the time. I'm not sure how much journals and logs are used. But if you have an opportunity during an orientation period where you can have a person journal, um, it's actually very useful. So reflection is likely one of the most important tools that we have, Bassion 2011 in Ulrich um, on page 60, says the willingness to reconsider and revise views where honest reflection suggests that change is warranted is an important component of critical thinking. And sometimes it's th through this process that we learn the most. We start early with students asking them to reflect on their experience in their clinical logs, uh, what went well, what provides support for your assessment of what went well? What would you do differently? Um, this is uh, much like the one-minute preceptor technique, uh, but applied to a clinical setting. 
So this is one of those things that uh, if you use the one minute preceptor technique, you can actually ask people to use that same technique as they write about their experience. We believe that a nurse who can reflect and self-evaluate about what went right or went wrong is a valuable asset to any organization. And keeping a journal is a great tool to use uh, with students and for new graduates. So the third a tool, uh, formative and summative assessment. So what if we could ask this monarch butterfly about midway through the hatch to give us some perspective on what it was like to move from the larval caterpillar stage to the pupa chrysalis stage and then into becoming a full butterfly E through the process of metamorphosis. If they could talk, they would give us a formative and summative appraisal of the experience. And of course, we have the scientific information on this process. But I'm asking here about a butterfly's eye view, which is so important. The, uh, for formative assessment, the goal is to monitor preceptee learning, to provide ongoing feedback that can be used to improve practice. So we identify strengths and weaknesses and target areas that need work. We help the preceptee uh, recognize the area that they are, where they are struggling and we can, so we can make adjustments. So as an example, one area that we hear often about is that it's difficult for new grads to set priorities. A novice nurse often has difficulty setting priorities since every task seems to be very important. Every request needs their immediate attention. Every concern has equal weight. Uh, Benner, on 2010, on page 50, found that students develop clinical judgment through coaching about priorities and when preceptors serve as role models. So if you recall from module four, the clip with Caleb Jort talking about that missed opportunity when he left the student in his office as he ran down the hall to take care of a minor issue, one of the things that might have happened uh, if he had had the student accompany him, he noted, uh, is that the student might have learned about priority setting. Uh, and, and this is something he probably takes it for granted. He recognized how many things he was made aware of it. He was attuned to it because he had the student in his office. And I think that was a really good example of how we, we just know what we know and we move from one thing to another very quickly. And we don't realize all the steps it takes. So for uh, summative assessment, the goal of, uh, is to evaluate preceptee learning at the end of an instructional unit by comparing it against some pre-established standard or benchmark. So summative assessments are often high stakes, which means that they have a very high point value, uh, tr often critical importance. So an example of a summative assessment would be a, a midterm exam, a final project, a big paper, uh, a senior recital, or NCLEX. So I ask uh, Caleb Jort, uh, how do you go about evaluating performance and giving formative and summative feedback? And this is what he said. So evaluating performance, um, I, you know, I have 40 some staff, nurses and mental health specialists that report to me. And so, you know, that's who I have to do performance evaluations for. So I do them a lot. And then of course, doing it as a preceptor for a, a preceptee, um, I think probably one of the most important things would be to be honest. You know, it's the whole honesty is the best policy truth will set you free. Um, and I don't think I see that a lot in performance reviews, be it for nursing students or um, as managers evaluating their employees. And I think a lot of that comes from, as a manager or preceptor, fear of giving somebody bad news or being looked at as somebody who was a grump or negative or 
you know, picking on the person. Um, but I think that you as a preceptor or as a manager owe that to the people that are looking to you for feedback and that is to be honest. Um, and so if it means something as trivial or as simple as saying, you know, when you showed up for work, you are showed up for your, your precepting, um, you you didn't quite meet the dress attire and you had on a, you know, a pretty shabby looking sweater and a pair of, you know, rough looking slacks or, um, and so even if it's something as simple as that, or don't be afraid to give them some real, um, good, but pointed feedback on clinical performance and don't just sugarcoat it, sugarcoat it by saying, oh, you're a great nurse and everybody loves you. Um, I really think you need to be honest. So we have uh, on this next evaluation tool, a performance evaluation rubrics, um, we have a, a number of examples of performance uh, evaluation rubrics. The first is fairly intricate. It is actually based on public health nurse competency levels that we adapted at one point in time for a graduate program, a clinical nurse leader um, a master's program. And the components involve, as you can see, the, the awareness means the individual may be able to identify the concept or skill. And there are levels of awareness, one through five. And then knowledge is individuals able to apply, describe, and perform this skill. And then uh, proficiency means that the individual is able to synthesize, critique, or teach the skill. And so as we look at, um, for especially for the graduate students, many come with very different abilities. And so often we want them to do a self-assessment. So we'll hand them this tool, and it's much more than just this one line or two lines. Um, it's a full tool with every um, aspect of the clinical nurse leader competencies listed. But we ask them to evaluate every objective and sub-objectives based on the goal that they're looking at. Um, how well can you do this, and what level are you at? And it is really amazing how uh, self-aware graduate students are about their abilities. Um, some have done parts of, of our program at a proficient level. And uh, on that same item, uh, another person may be at the early awareness level. And so this really gives us a feel for who we're working with and how we go about um, helping them develop based on their individual needs. So in example two, this is from Swihart and Figueroa. Um, this is a, a new book that's out, the Preceptor Program Builder, Essential Tools for a Successful Preceptor Program. And they have a very nice tool, the Performance Appraisal Rating Scale, in the book. And so they have um, uh, clarified everything and based it on excellent performance, good, average, and poor performance. And so let me give you an idea of what each of these mean. Um, so under excellent performance, the preceptee consistently functions with minimal need for guidance, except in unusual work situations. And on the other end of the spectrum, the poor, the preceptee functions only with direct supervision in more, most work situations. And so there are actually five um, areas under excellent good, average, and poor. Um, uh, let me see. Let me just read one additional one. Um, number four is initiates a request to new learning for new learning opportunities. And number four, on the other end of the spectrum, unable to recognize the need to learn new skills or knowledge. And so you can see that this is very broad, but it's also very specific. And you know, you can put some anecdotes and some uh, examples under each and help people uh, move their poor performance uh, up the scale. Uh, you know, what can I do? I could seek out more learning experiences. I could um, a attempt to actually not have so much direct supervision, but maybe uh, connect to you in a different way. And I'll oversee, and I'm, I'm just, just gradually going to back off. And so this gives preceptors a wonderful tool in which to begin to work with 
um, a new graduate or undergraduate or a new employee. The third example is um, actually from a clinical evaluation tool. And the rubric actually has us evaluate students by satisfactory, unsatisfactory, needs improvement, or sometimes we say they have had no opportunity. So when we do clinical evaluation tools, um, many of you may have remembered these, uh, these tools from your past. Uh, but satisfactory, we uh, specifically define what it means. And so it means for every objective that the person consistently demonstrates the objective, increasingly able to exhibit greater independence in familiar learning situations, able to master increasingly complex learning situations, recognizes limitations, and seeks guidance when appropriate, applies theoretical concepts in clinical practice. Decisions are based upon appropriate rationale and previous learning. Uh, initiates inquiry and pursues learning opportunities, exhibits accountability, responsibility, and other professional behaviors. And pretty much if people are able to do that at each level, then they are making good progress. Unsatisfactory, of course, means the opposite. Uh, and needs improvement is often a place where you can um, actually clarify someone is along the way. They've had a start date here, and their end date is there and you're midway, and here's what you could do to improve your progress. So this uh, webinar is going to be a little shorter than uh, the other webinars. The webinars are one hour long, and by the time you do these activities, um, you will have spent at least an hour and be awarded the contact hours appropriately. So what we've just looked at are uh, the roadmaps that should be provided to the preceptor from the academic institution or your organization if you are precepting an orientee or a new graduate. And if someone is just left, you know, dropped off uh, and said, well, you know, here's your preceptee, good luck, um, you need to say, oh, wait, I doubt that happens very often. But if it does, um, you have to go back to the originator, whether it's the academic institution or um, the organization where you work, and I uh, say, I'm happy to precept this person. I have to have some guidelines. Um, what are we doing? What is the challenge? And we have kind of went through that in Module 4 a little bit. So, at, um, so look for your roadmap. That's the one uh, piece of advice I would have for you. So in terms of Activity 1, what you can do, and all of these resources will be on the MontanaCon website under resources. We'll put them under Activity 1. They'll be Exhibit 1, Exhibit 2. Um, so Activity 1 is actually just a sample of evaluation tools. And um, when, for instance, these are not, um, these are sort of like the end of the and the preceptorship evaluation tools, uh, they can be. Uh, so on Exhibit 1, uh, the preceptor evaluation of a student's performance in, in a course uh, or in an experience uh, that they've been precepted in. Uh, the example is from an undergraduate uh, leadership course. In fact, that's the course that Caleb has been the preceptor for, um, the management and leadership course that uh, the students are in. So this is an undergraduate evaluation tool. Um, it can be adapted, um, but it's available. And um, so it's a way that the preceptor can provide um, some specific feedback to the, either to your, the parent organization or the um, academic institution where the student comes from. Exhibit 2 is a preceptor evaluation of the preceptor experience. So this is a self-evaluation tool, also used uh, in the undergraduate leadership course, but it allows the preceptor to think about uh, you know, what this experience was like for them. And the more feedback we get, you know, that's when we all can adjust, just like students adjust. You know, faculty and preceptors adjust also. 
is say, well, you know, I think I'd do that differently next time. Um, that's the exciting part of teaching and working with uh, students or working with um, a new employee. Um, you have an opportunity to reflect just like they do. And so this is a tool uh, to use for that. The third tool is the performance appraisal rating scale from Swire and Figaro that I talked to you about. And there's a little asterisk by it. Um, I won't be able to post it until, and it's pending permission of the authors, um, I will contact Diana Swihart and ask about the use of that. But in case it isn't available, um, you could get a copy of her book. Uh, and um, again, that is the Preceptor Program Builder. Um, and it was recently published, and um, that's on page 162. So I think the value of this tool is it's for any preceptee, <clears throat> for a new grad, a new employer, or a student. Exhibit 4 is um, just a different level of a student. This is for a graduate student in a family nurse practitioner clinical capstone course. It's a preceptor evaluation of the graduate um, and the graduate student is being evaluated by the preceptor in, with that tool. And number five, uh, clinical faculty evaluation of the FNP student preceptor. So everybody's evaluating everybody else. The um, preceptors are uh, often are given, uh, in some programs anyway, are given affiliate faculty status. And so we. Um, we want the preceptors to evaluate the clinical faculty, and the clinical faculty often uh, evaluate the preceptor. Um, we have some of the finest uh, preceptors any place, and we don't want to um, exhaust them, wear them out. We're constantly looking for uh, additional and new people that want to join the ranks of preceptor. And so you know, this is a way for us all to develop together. On Exhibit 6, um, this is the preceptee, a graduate or undergraduate student evaluation of a clinical faculty. So there's all of these tools, and um, you know I find it useful at least to have some examples. And of course, anything can be modified. Um, and you know I think that especially on those tools that are proprietary, like the performance appraisal rating scale, giving credit is really important. So that's. Tools, that's kind of sort of some basic evaluation tools. Um, so this activity, too, will examine the connections among goals, objectives, competencies, and the tools that help um, us evaluate goals, objectives, and competencies that are achieved. And so I don't have quite as many uh, listed here. But what I'm hoping is, just like in the previous slide I failed to mention, if you have uh, a tool that you would like to contribute to this list, uh, I really encourage you, encourage you to contact me. I would love to hear from any of you at any time. I'd, I'd love to hear if you, know, you give me feedback on these modules. Uh, but if you have something you say, this really works for us, and this is how we use it, I'd love to hear from you. So I have uh, just three examples, the Exhibit 1, is from a population-based community public health course. Uh, it's a clinical evaluation tool. And the focus uh, is, of course, undergraduates. And the competencies that are incorporated into the tool are the public health nurse competencies. And this is an important thing. You always want to look and see if you can see what the model is, what's the competency model they use to um, expect the growth in the student or the preceptee. So in the second example, Exhibit 2, um, this is a uh, clinical performance evaluation tool used in um, a pediatric course. So it's an undergraduate pediatric course. And very interesting, it's completely based on the undergraduate Houston competency, the quality, safety, and education for nursing competencies. If you remember, we talked about the Houston competencies in modules 1 and 4. And the Houston competencies are very similar to uh, the COPA competencies and model. And the Houston competencies were based on IOM reports 
on quality and safety. And so they're really very current and uh, very popular now. Um, it, it really does help organizations um, raising up nurses, preparing nurses, um, uh, encouraging the growth of nurses to be using the cues and competencies, and we hope you will do that. On Exhibit 3, um, I mentioned the Clinical Nurse Leader Graduate Program. Um, this is a clinical evaluation tool we use for them, and it's for, of course, graduate master's students, and it's based on the CNL competencies, the AACN CNL competencies. Very specific. Uh, let me give you an example of one. So one goal for a CNL is a, a clinician goal. And it assumes accountability for healthcare outcomes for a specific group of clients within a unit or setting, recognizing the influence of the meso and macro systems on the microsystem, assimilates and applies research-based information to design, implement, and evaluate client plans of care. Now, that's kind of a long goal. It probably should be two or three goals, but anyway, under the clinician uh, role or the CNL, that's what they expect. Um, that's the that's the endpoint. So, two subjective is using an existing database evaluates aggregate care outcomes, which is designated micro microsystem with focus on specific nursing interventions. And the second one is contributes to interdisciplinary plans of care based on best practice guidelines and evidence-based practice. And so that's uh, that. Those are our subjectives, and each person then would go to their preceptor and say, um, here's what I need to accomplish. And the preceptor says, okay, I know how to provide you access to existing databases within our institution. Um, we can get you to the place where you need to, to be in order to uh, achieve the, the um, expectations of this course and also the end, um, the end of program CNL competencies. Finally, the, the last uh, activity three, um, every program, um, whether it's a, most academic programs, will have some kind of a preceptor manual or a clinical resource handbook. Or they might have just a preceptorship policies and procedures. It has the same idea, um, who does what, what are the expectations of the organization and the partner academic institution. Everything is lined up, and it's pretty well uh, clarified for each uh, uh, for each institution, whatever. So you can see this institution has these preceptors that they're bringing to us to our setting, and here's what they expect. And so I have uh, three examples. Um, the first is also a proprietary, and many of you know Nurse Tim. Um, I attended a preceptor uh, webinar uh, from Nurse Tim. It was excellent. And a part of the, that webinar is he had a, um, a sample clinical handbook. And so I have to, um, pending permission of, of the author of, of the Nurse Tim organization, I'll post that. Um, but basically the focus of this uh, handbook is communication between students, faculty, and preceptors, uh, whether they're undergraduates or graduates. And it has some, uh, you know, just basic procedures, policies about how they go about doing that. Exhibit two uh, is from an RN to BSN program uh, that is online. And it is a preceptor clinical resource manual. This is a group that we have worked with. Um, here in Montana, and it's for BSN students, preceptors, and faculty. And so that's actually available on the Montana Tech website. If you could just look at that yourself anytime. But we will post it in, on the Montana Con website. Uh, a third is just a policy and procedure, an example of a policy and procedure um, for a preceptor ship for required undergraduate nursing course. and. Uh, this is for BSN students in a capstone course with preceptors and faculty. 
So those are the three. Again, if you have any examples or you want to contribute, please email me. I'd love to hear from you, uh, especially from practice sites, because I don't have near enough um, information about what different practice sites are doing in terms of their policies and procedures or manuals or handbooks, um, what kind of tools they they use for one thing or another. So I think that would be really valuable. So pitfalls. Hmm. I don't know. I can't imagine pitfalls as far as evaluation um, as a preceptor. Uh, it's possible that you could encounter an individual that is resistant to feedback. That's always a possibility. Um, it's not a very good characteristic in a nurse, you know. Um, nurses work on teams, and we're constantly providing feedback and providing um, input to one another and helping one another. And it's a partnership, and um, it's a collaboration of working together with patients and you know, anyone who is really seriously um, disturbed by receiving constructive feedback, positive feedback, um, you know, may need to think about that a little bit and may need to write in their journal about it and figure out why, what, what, where is this coming from because it's so important to my profession. You could have a person who, who might refuse to self-evaluate, again, um, that introspection is part of our profession. We do that all the time. And so in the, the best of all worlds, all this will be is a beautiful site to explore. Um, and, and I don't think you, we have to think of it as falling into anything uh, rather than exploring something. Now, will you hit a granite wall along the way in your process of evaluating uh, preceptors or um, receiving um, feedback uh, from clinical faculty? Uh, you might, and uh, you know, I think that when I look at a granite wall, I think of all my friends who love to climb these things, uh, who put um, go to all uh, efforts to um, get over the top of something and to um, that wouldn't look at this at all and see it as insurmountable. And I feel the same way. I, and I think we are we're sure to encounter some challenges along the way as we precept, but. Um, I think they're just things that we learn from. And so I don't see this much as a barrier. But again, you can tell us if um, you see things differently. So remembering our mountain goats that we started with as the evaluators looking out and, and looking at the, the others that are on the side of the mountain. Uh, most likely, you will encounter curiosity from the next generation of nurses, individuals eager to learn all they can in order to contribute to this amazing profession. So in this module, we have discussed the preceptor's evaluator role, evaluation tools including performance evaluation rubrics, and formative and summative assessment tools, ways that goals, objectives, and competencies are linked and measured, approaches for providing effective, positive, and constructive feedback, and the importance of self-reflection and self-assessment in evaluation. So one last um, clip from Caleb Jort. Um, I asked him, what should all faculty know about the preceptor role? And I thought he would talk about the time commitment and extra effort involved in precepting. But instead, well, he talked about something else. I think what I kind of one of my answers earlier was as a preceptor, just realizing that it's not just for the preceptee, it's for the preceptor also. And it would it really will help your your clinical practice in whatever fields that you're in. Um, to identify things that you can do better or things that you aren't doing right. I mean, students always come in with, as we probably all know, fresh ideas from school and um, the current best practice, evidence best practice. And so they really challenge you to take a look at, well, you know, why are we doing it this way? Is it time to change? Um, and kind of 
breathe some of that lifeblood back into nursing of it isn't just stagnant, same old, same old. It's, it's an ever-changing thing. And so when you have these new preceptees coming to you on a regular basis, whether you're taking them one or two preceptees a year, um, just look at it from that side as if there's something to be gained as a preceptor. The Academic Progression in Nursing Team, Galen Dorhauer, Rita Cheek, Kristen Juliar, and me, I'm Sandy Kuntz, and the Montana Center to Advance Health Through Nursing, co-lead Cynthia Gustafson and Casey Blumenthal, would like to thank you for joining us for these five preceptor module webinars. I am very interested in talking to anyone in practice or education who has suggestions for improving these existing webinars or adding additional webinars on precepting to this series. What other topics would be helpful to you as we work together to enrich the preceptor role in nursing? Thank you, and have a great afternoon. So evaluating performance, um, I, you know, I have 40 some staff, nurses and mental health specialists that report to me. And so, you know, that's who I have to do performance evaluations for. So I do them a lot. And then of course, doing it as a preceptor for a, a preceptee, um, I think probably one of the most important things would be to be honest. You know, it's the whole honesty is the best policy truth will set you free. Um, and I don't think I see that a lot in performance reviews, be it for nursing students or um, as managers evaluating their employees. And I think a lot of that comes from, as a manager or preceptor, fear of giving somebody bad news or being looked at as somebody who was a grump or negative or, you know, picking on the person. Um, but I think that you as a preceptor or as a manager owe that to the people that are looking to you for feedback and that is to be honest. Um, and so if it means something as trivial or as simple as saying, you know, when you showed up for work, you are showed up for your, your precepting, um, your, you didn't quite meet the dress attire and you had on a you know, a pretty shabby looking sweater and a pair of, you know, rough looking slacks or, um, and so even if it's something as simple as that, or don't be afraid to give them some real um, good but pointed feedback on clinical performance and don't just sugarcoat it, sugarcoat it by saying, oh, you're a great nurse and everybody loves you. Um, I really think you need to be honest. So, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, so the most, I got to read it again. Faculty, what should faculty know about the preceptor role? Um, I think what I kind of, one of my answers earlier was as a preceptor, just realizing that it's not just for the preceptee, it's for the preceptor also. And it would, it really will help your, your clinical practice in whatever fields that you're in um, to identify things that you can do better or things that you aren't doing right. I mean, Students always come in with, as we probably all know, fresh ideas from school and um, the current best practice, evidence best practice. And so they really challenge you to take a look at, well, you know, why are we doing it this way? Is it time to change? Um, and kind of breathe some of that lifeblood back into nursing of it isn't just stagnant, same old, same old. It's, it's an ever-changing thing. And so when you have these new preceptees coming to you, on a regular basis, whether you're taking them one or two preceptees a year, um, just look at it from that side as if there's something to be gained as a pre